PQA would like to thank Aspen Rx Health for being an educational sponsor of today's Quality Essentials webinar. Aspen Rx Health, with the first mobile-based application of its kind, deploys inventive technology to foster longitudinal, re longitudinal relationships between healthcare members and its robust community of pharmacists. This creates an entirely new approach to match clinical pharmacists who are looking to practice at the top of their license with members deserving the best care experiences, making it easier for health plans and providers to achieve greater results while reducing costs without ever forsaking quality. Thank you to Aspen Rx Health for your support of PQA today and throughout the year. And you can learn more about Aspen Rx Health at aspenrxhealth.com. All right, before we get into our content, I would like to encourage everyone here today um, to please register for the 2022 PQA annual meeting. It will be held May 3rd through the 5th at the Hilton Baltimore Inner Harbor. Please note that early registration does end on Monday, April the 4th. And this is also the deadline to book your hotel room. I'll post the registration link in the chat here momentarily, and we look forward to seeing you at the PQA annual meeting. Um, with that, I will turn the floor over to Lisa. Thanks, Amanda. So today's pre presenters are Melissa Castora Binkley, Senior Director of Research at PQA. Ben Shirley, Director of Performance Measurement at PQA, and I am Lisa Hines, Chief Quality and Innovation Officer. Next slide. Thank you. So Ben will kick the session off with an overview of PQA adherence measures, and Melissa will illustrate the ongoing impact of the measures. And the three of us are going to discuss some common misperceptions, and then we'll wrap up by sharing some future directions for PQA adherence measures, and also um, go through some Q&A with participant questions. Uh, next slide. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ben. You're on mute. That is helpful. Um, thanks, Lisa, and welcome, everyone. Really glad that you could join us. Really important topic. Um, so to get started on the next slide here, uh, with an overview of PQA's adherence measures, where it really makes sense to start um, is going back to the basics. So what exactly is adherence? Um, it's a good question. Adherence really has sort of a number of definitions that get at roughly the same underlying concept. Uh, to choose one representative definition here on the slide, uh, the CDC defines adherence as the extent to which an individual's behavior corresponds to recommendations from a healthcare provider. Now, we can make that a little bit more specific uh, for PQA's purposes. So in the context of medication use broadly in pharmacy, adherence really is going to be talking about the extent to which a patient takes medications as prescribed, sample twice daily for a month or whatever the recommended regimen is. Uh, and this really is an important uh, aspect of medication use quality. Many of us have sort of heard this Simple saying that medications are only effective when they're taken, but that really is true. Medications need to be on hand for patients to be effective. It's a really important part of quality that we can't overlook uh, as we think about medication use quality. Next slide, please. Um, now we're going to be talking about, uh, about adherence methodologies and proportion of days covered specifically. Um, but it's worth noting that adherence is often used sort of as an umbrella term. It's used a little bit loosely. And as we'll get to a portion of days covered or PDC, it's not necessarily going to be the right choice for every situation. For example, PQA actually uses a persistence rather than an adherence methodology for basal insulin to really sort of address the fact that that day's supply field for insulin on prescription claims, it's not really reliable for the purposes of PDC. So instead of adherence, we actually take a persistence approach. Uh, similarly, for hepatitis C, uh, the treatment of chronic hepatitis C therapy uh, measure actually focuses on the completion of a fixed duration of therapy. Uh, and primary medication non-adherence there goes even further upstream, looking at whether or not that first fill was ever actually picked up by the patient. So there's really a large constellation uh, of related concepts that tend to fall over this umbrella of adherence. But now we're going to get into uh, adherence a little bit more specifically and some of the methodologies on the next slide.
So given the existence, right, of lots of different potential approaches, a reasonable person might ask, how exactly did PQA land on PDC for most of our, uh, our adherence measures? Uh, it's a really good question. And it really comes down to the fact that you can take two sort of different broad approaches to measurement uh, of adherence and really to measurement uh, of many different things in the healthcare space. So route one on the left there is going to be greater data complexity, uh, lower feasibility. So this really is going to be approaches that are very precise, but have more complex data. And as a result, they're less feasible. You have to remember the PQA measures uh, are generally going to be calculated uh, using standard data sources, things like administrative claims, and need to be consistently calculated across all the measured entities. So direct patient observation, things like measurement of metabolites, those are gonna be extremely precise. You can't get much more precise than those. But what you run into is a really substantial measurement burden that's associated with collecting that data, which also doesn't exist in a standardized way. There's a lot of uh, different ways that that data can be collected, presented, and reported, which makes it really challenging from a measurement perspective. Prescription cap monitoring systems also going to face uh, similar burdens, but ultimately, really these high burden uh, adherence monitoring or measurement strategies aren't a good fit for quality measurement at large scale. For example, the scale needed for Medicare Part D. So in that context, uh, or Medicaid or the individual markets or whatever program you're thinking about, the approaches on the right really are we're going to see that feasibility element met, right? We're going to see claims-based approaches like medication possession ratio or MPR and PDC that use standardized data sources, things like prescription claims, and are relatively straightforward to calculate with a really high degree of consistency, which makes them the right fit uh, for quality measurement. So it's worth taking just a minute here before we go any further to talk about PDC and MPR, which are two very closely related methodologies for calculating adherence, but they differ in some really important ways. So PQA measures use the PDC methodology for a number of reasons uh, that for the most part have also sort of been borne out and, and demonstrated by the literature. So PDC has a, a more consistent operational defer uh, definition, right? It's more concretely defined, which reduces the potential variation uh, in the calculation reporting of measures. That's really important for consistency and making sure the uh, rates that we're looking at are in fact apples to apples comparisons. Uh, PDC also is less likely to overestimate adherence uh, due to things like early refills or medication switching. Uh, and in general, it's going to be the best choice when discontinuation is not expected and when day supply and prescription claims are accurate. And finally, it's, it's important to note that PDC measures are used in a number of programs, uh, and several PDC measures have actually received that extra stamp of approval from the National Quality Forum, uh, which really sort of speaks to the external validation, not just by PQA as medication use experts, but from quality experts more broadly. And we continue to see PD, uh, PDC become more, uh, more prevalent in the literature and in research as the preferred methodology over NPR. So here on this slide, what we have uh, is the long list. Uh, it's the overview of PQA's current portfolio of endorsed PDC measures. You can see that these measures uh, span both the chronic disease space and what we call the specialty space. So that's going to be things like antiretrovirals, uh, multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis measures. Uh, so many folks we know are familiar primarily with what we call the big three sometimes. That's going to be diabetes, ROSAs and statins. Uh, but it's worth calling out, we've sort of got this whole wide variety of adherence measures available for use and that are used uh, in a variety of different quality programs. So now I think that it's, it's a good time to take a few minutes and go under the hood uh, of an adherence measure a little bit and look at sort of the blueprints. Uh, and specifically this time, we're going to look at the PDC ROSA measure. So while various PDC measures, right, they're going to have little specific differences, whether that's different exclusions, slightly different definitions, logic, et cetera, PDC RASA is really going to be a good example of the overarching architecture of this type of measure, this PQA PDC measure. So verbatim from the specifications, the denominator is individuals 18 years of age and older who are continuously enrolled with at least two prescription claims for any RASA uh, on different dates of service in the treatment period. Now that sentence uh, is great, but it includes a lot of terms that might be helpful to look at a little bit more closely and break down. So thinking about the age requirement, that 18 years of older piece, that's going to be in alignment with the evidence and clinical guidelines related to this specific medication class and 
the related disease states. The continuous enrollment requirement, uh, which just means that the individual is continuously enrolled with the health plan because this is a health plan PDC measure, is there to uh, really ensure that the data required to calculate the measure is present, right? If a plan doesn't have data for some set of months, then you can't calculate a, an adherence measure because it'll be missing that important data and your PDC estimate is not going to be correct. Uh, and you also want to be sure that the plan uh, that's being held accountable actually had the individual enrolled and thus could be fairly held accountable for their care. Uh, we do require those multiple prescription claims on different dates really to ensure ongoing use. Remember, we don't want uh, discontinuation with PDC. That's, that's something that, that doesn't work very well with the PDC methodology. We do have the medication table. It's going to specifically lay out target medications and individuals can be covered. Uh, by any of those medications in the applicable table for this FRASA measure. So switching within that medication table does count. And finally, the treatment period uh, is going to begin on what we call the IPSD or the index prescription start date. That's the first fill during the measurement period for a RASA or a target medication. And it's going to end with the end of the measurement period, typically a year, uh, the patient's death or the patient's disenrollment from the health plan. Uh, we do have some exclusions as well. These exclusions are typically intended to account for situations where uh, being held accountable to this measure is not appropriate for specific populations of patients. So for RASA, we have hospice, which, as you can imagine, is a population with a very different set of risks, benefits, and therapeutic goals. Uh, End-stage renal disease, similarly, a population with very specific um, and important clinical considerations uh, and finally, individuals uh, with prescription claims for Secubitril, Valsartan in the measurement year are also excluded due to that product uh, having a very different indication compared to the other RASAs included in this measure. Now, on the numerator side, we have the number of individuals essentially who met this PDC threshold of 80% during the year. Uh, that means essentially the number of individuals covered by at least one RASA during 80% of the days in the measurement period. Uh, and if those days supply overlap for the same target drug, what you do is you adjust to begin the second prescription claims days the day after the day's supply for the previous claim. Now that can sound a little bit like a mind bender or a tongue twister. So for the visual folks, we think that this will hopefully make it a little bit clearer. So what we have here uh, on the slide are the fills for a patient. This patient is John Doe or Jane Doe, uh, who has three 90-day fills for lisinopril on the dates of service of March 25th, July 5th, and September 25th. You'll notice that we made all of these dates um, 2018. So John or Jane Doe are living in the happy pre-COVID days, uh, which I'll be so lucky. Uh, but what you can see from just some quick mental math here is between those first two fills, uh, there's going to be a gap, right? 90 days after March 25th is not going to get you to July 5th. So those are going to result in uncovered days that are going to bring down the PDC. And if you look at the chart on the bottom left, you're going to see the gap between those two bars representing fills. Those are uncovered days. Now then for the, the third fill, what we have is the opposite situation. We have an early refill. And this time, uh, looking back at that chart, you're going to see the shaded area. It's going to be shifted over. And that's to show that the start date has been pushed to align with the end of the previous fill. So taking this all together, what we see is uh, an index date of 325 a uh, treatment period that then extends from there to the end of the year. So that's going to be a total of 282 days. 270 of those are covered, pretty good. That's good for a PDC of 95%, which is numerator compliant. And we can see there are three unique dates of service. So assuming that continuous enrollment uh, and other measure criteria are met and there are no exclusions, it looks like John or Jane Doe are going to be denominator and numerator uh, compliant. Now, one more thing before we pass it off um, is that there's often this sort of methodological um, misconception or mix up that PDC uh, is a continuous measure. Now, PDC itself is continuous, but PDC measures, PQA's PDC measures are actually dichotomous, not continuous. So the PDC measure rate is not the average <laughs> PDC of all members. Instead, what it is is the proportion of patients who are over the PDC threshold. Uh, so it's going to be a binary one zero measure for each patient. Now the, the PDC threshold is also not established arbitrarily, right? It's established based off of evidence where patients are reasonably likely to achieve the most clinical benefit. 
But generally, that's going to be 80% that many of you are likely familiar with. Uh, but for some measures, there's going to be a different threshold. For example, the antiretroviral measure actually requires 90% PDC for numerator compliance based on the evidence in the literature for those medications and those disease states. Um, so that is sort of an overview of, of adherence and a little bit about our methodologies. But I think that we have the, 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 the what, and now we're looking at the so what. So to talk a little bit about the, the impact, I think I can pass the baton to Melissa here. Thanks so much, Ben. As Ben mentioned, we are gonna talk about impact next, but let's talk first about where these adherence measures are implemented. Uh, the PQA adherence measures are widely used in national, state, and regional quality programs. The three measures ad assessing adherence to diabetes medications, RAS antagonists, and statins are not only used in the Medicare Part D star ratings, but they're also used in the health insurance marketplace quality rating system. They're used also in the Integrated Healthcare Association's Align Measure Perform, which is a pay, pay for performance program in California. And some states use or require reporting of PQA adherence measures. For example, New, uh, New Hampshire Medicaid publicly reports nine PQA adherence measures. The PQA adherence measures are also used for accreditation, such as Eurex Specialty Pharmacy, Mail Service Pharmacy, and PBM accreditation. And PQA adherence measures are also used in a variety of other value-based arrangements, federally funded grants and research, including from the CDC, NIH, and CMS. Speaking of CMS, the three adherence measures included in the Medicare Part D star ratings are the medication adherence for cholesterol, medication adherence for diabetes medications, and medication adherence for hypertension. CMS produces what's known as the National Impact Assessment, and the one that was published just recently in 2021 combined the MAPD with the PDP rates and examined the years between 2013 and 2018 and found an enormous impact. Based on measure improvements, 4 million more beneficiaries on statins were inherent than if these improvements were not there. Similarly, almost 900,000 more beneficiaries on diabetes medications were adherent, and 3 million more beneficiaries on RAS antagonists were adherent. The costs avoided based on these improvements are huge, as you can see, and when combined are between 27 and $46.6 .6 billion. I don't know about you, but when we start talking about millions and billions and trillions, it's really hard to put that in context. So let's do that for a second here. Um, and these numbers actually become even more impressive. So in this impact assessment report that was published in 2021 by CMS, there were 15 measures included in the cost analysis. And the PDC measures accounted for approximately 90% of the total costs avoided associated with measure improvement in this report. So other than the CMS analyses, what other evidence exists to support the measures linked to outcomes? This slide is a rather simple depiction of the very robust evidence base for the focus of the adherence measures and their links to a number of outcomes. For example, the adherence to statins are associated with reduced hospitalization in both, uh, both reduced hospitalization and emergency department visits and lower total annual healthcare costs. Additionally, adherence to statins are associated with lower rates of cardiovascular events and ischemic stroke. Adherence to diabetes medications are similarly associated with reduced hospitalizations, emergency department visits, outpatient visits, and lower total annual healthcare costs. Adherence to RAS antagonists are not only associated with reduced hospitalizations, emergency department visits, outpatient visits, and lower total healthcare costs, but also associated with better disease-free survival after myocardial infarction. I'll hand it back over to Lisa. Thanks, Melissa. So now we wanna talk about some common statements that we hear or read from stakeholders and provide some clarifications. So,
the, the first is that because they don't directly assess the taking of medications, adherence measures are not valuable or less meaningful. Ben, what do you say to that? Yeah, Lisa, you know, unfortunately, that is what we call a myth. So in fact, there really is substantial evidence that links improvements in PDC scores to reduce costs, to improved outcomes across all sorts of different metrics that Melissa just spoke to at length. Um, in fact, CMS actually estimates that these measures have been associated with nearly 50 billion uh, in costs avoided and interventions that focus on adherence we found uh, can yield as much as a 13 to one benefit cost ratio. So when you think about it, it really comes down to what we discussed at the start of this call. Medications really can't be effective uh, if they're not taken and they can't be taken if they're not on hand. So the fact is the adherence measures do correlate strongly uh, with all of these important metrics because they get at such an important and fundamental and really intuitive aspect of quality. So I think that we can call that myth busted. Thanks, Ben. So Melissa, uh, we frequently hear or read that um, the Part D star ratings adherence measures are topped out. What do you say to that? Lisa, I'm so glad you brought this up. This is definitely a myth. Let's talk about why. So PQA did an analysis of public data from the Medicare Part C and D performance data website. And among Medicare Advantage prescription drug programs, the average adherence measure scores have risen to 86% for diabetes. That's a 13 percentage point increase over time risen to 87% for hypertension, which is a 15 percentage point increase over time, and 86% for cholesterol, which is an 18% percentage point increase over time. So as you can see here, there's been year over year improvement on all three measures, but you might be asking, how long can this last? Well, when measure rates in a quality program are no longer improving and there's little to no variation in measure performance among measured entities, it is likely that there's little opportunity left for improvement. This is what's known conceptually as being topped out. So in other words, topped out measures may no longer provide value to the system when providers have reached their peak performance. So are these measures topped out? Well, there's not a technical definition for the STAR ratings program. So what we've done is we borrowed a technical definition from the CMS End Stage Renal Disease Quality Improvement Program and applied that to the 2022 STAR ratings measure data to address some of these concerns. And our analyses found that there remain statistically significant differences between the 10th and 25th percentiles and the 75th and 90th percentiles. What does that mean? There is still variation in these measures. Now, before we leave this one, Lisa, let's talk about a critical point in this discussion of topping out. And that's that it focuses on average performance and it doesn't take into account performance in subpopulations that can be masked by the majority performance. In other words, there should be some consideration of underlying disparities in performance in this discussion of topping out. Thanks, Melissa. So, so Ben, what about gaming? Um, are, are all of these interventions that are used like extended day supply just simply gaming and, and not meaningful? Well, Lisa, you know, I hate to call you out, but I think that I'm going to call this one um, a myth. And, and I think that this is one that, that really doesn't stand up to, to close scrutiny. Um, really the fact is that strategies that inc uh, increase, you know, the ability of patients to consistently obtain medications and take those medications and thus you know, receive the therapeutic benefits. Those sorts of strategies are not gaming. Uh, they're, they're perfectly legitimate because they actually improve quality for patients. So you think about strategies like, like 90 day fills, right? Or medication synchronization, med sync. In reality, what those are are very patient centric uh, approaches that reduce the burden of patients related to getting their medication and then taking their medication. So if, if we put ourselves in patient shoes and it shouldn't be very difficult because so many of us you know, do take some medication of some kind, we've all had situations where we uh, or a loved one, we lose track of how much we have left, right? Um, and we don't have any refills left for whatever reason, even though we swear that we, we talk to the doctor about it. 
but it's Saturday and the office is closed. Um, and so now, you know, we're going to end up going a few days without our medication. That really is not a good situation. That is not proper high quality patient centric medication and management and, and disease state management. So you, you can imagine it, it gets even more severe once you start thinking about some of the barriers that specific patients face or even around SDOH related issues, issues related to transportation, for example, requiring people to make a trip to the pharmacy every 30 days, as opposed to every 90 days, that can actually be a substantial barrier for some patients. So I think that when we, when, when we call these legitimate strategies gaming, I think it, it really is sort of a, a fundamental misrepresentation. You have to consider this from the patient perspective, from the quality perspective, and strategies that really do improve quality for patients don't really represent gaming in, in any sort of way that we can recognize. So that's my take, Lisa. Thanks, Ben. So Melissa, outcome measures, outcome measures, outcome measures. Uh, that's what everybody wants. And um, if, if they were easy, there would be more of them for starters, but we often hear that it, the adherence measures should be replaced by clinical outcome measures. But what are your thoughts on that? Well, Lisa, you're going over four today. So <laughs> let's talk about that for a second. Clinical endpoint measures are valuable outcome measures, especially as our system moves towards outcome measurement. Adherence measures should be considered complementary rather than redundant. Now let's discuss why. So if we have, for example, an A1C control measure, which is a clinical outcome, we might be interested in what in understanding what's influencing this measure rate, what's going on. As Ben likes to say, what's happening under the hood? So what the diabetes medication adherence measure can do, which is an intermediate outcome measure, it can help understand the performance of the A1C control measure. It's a driver of the clinical outcome measure example here. So improving on the diabetes medication adherence measure will correlate with improvement on a clinical outcome measure like A1C. Thanks, Melissa. So Ben, adherence measures are pharmacy measures, true or false? So this is a really important one, Lisa. And what we can say is false, not always. Um, so really the key to understand this piece, which is somewhere where PQA you know, has, has spent a lot of time focusing and we've done a lot of stakeholder education around this. Adherence measures are not inherently pharmacy measures. And when we say pharmacy measure, there's even a lot of misconception around even what that term means. So when we say a pharmacy measure, what we mean is measures at the pharmacy level of attribution. That is a measure specified, a measure tested, and endorsed for use evaluating quality at a pharmacy as the unit of analysis. Now, a health plan measure on the other side is going to be a measure specified, tested, and endorsed for use evaluating a health plan. So a lot of adherence measures, right, like the PQA, PDC adherence measures that are used in the Part D star readings, those are actually health plan measures and should be used only for health plan evaluation. Right? That's where they were designed for, where they were tested for, and that's how they're implemented. However, what, what you need to understand also is the PQA has endorsed uh, some distinct pharmacy measures for adherence. And what, you, what is important, I think, here is that those include the, the design aspects that are critical for pharmacies. That's going to be things uh, like pharmacy attribution models, right? Which are going to be the way that you fairly identify and attribute patients uh, to the pharmacy based off of their day supply. Um, and also pharmacy measures are going to have things like minimum denominators. Since the, the pharmacy is such a smaller unit of analysis, it's important to have a minimum denominator to ensure that the measurement is actually going to be reliable. So what you need to remember is that pharmacy measures and health plan measures are distinct. And PDC or adherence measures are not inherently pharmacy measures. They're also not inherently health plan measures. There are separate versions of these measures specified for pharmacy and for health plans. And what you can't do is simply copy and paste between them without taking into account the differences between these types of entities. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate that distinction. So now we're going to move on to future directions for PQA adherence measures. Uh, so what does the future hold, Ben? Back to you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Lisa. And we've 
we've spent a lot of time talking about the portfolio and where we are and you know even a little bit of how we got there and what's happening now but what we want to do now is look at where we're going so one important measure that was actually recently pqa endorsed is the pharmacy pdc composite so this is going to be a composite pharmacy measure remember that distinction that we just talked about it's going to assess adherence to rasas statins and diabetes medications within one single week um, and this measure really was developed uh, in direct response to stakeholder needs that were communicated to PQA, namely the need for pharmacies to have valid and reliable measures that align with those health plan incentives for the purposes of planned pharmacy contracts, right? These are very closely aligned with the health plan versions that are in the STARS, except they include these important uh, pharmacy-specific design aspects. It has that patient pharmacy attribution model, which was created both through PQA empirical analysis and, and looking and diving in the data, and also a multi-stakeholder technical expert panel consensus. So we had a technical expert panel, including not only clinical and data experts, but with pharmacies and with payers on the line so that we could get to a model that everyone felt was fair. And that model is attributing patients uh, to the pharmacy with 51% or more of the day supply for a target medication. And when that, the individual doesn't have 51% or more in any pharmacy, during the measurement year, then that individual actually is not attributed because no pharmacy can be fairly held accountable for their care. It also includes, as I mentioned before, this, this minimum denominator of 30 patients to report since it is so important for, for measurement in these smaller units of analyses like individual pharmacies to have enough patients to be reliable and not just be susceptible to, to large amounts of noise from, from random chance. And another very important part of our strategy moving forward is a proportion of days covered composite, but at the health plan level, as opposed to the pharmacy level. So PQA is developing this currently. This is a measure that's going to be a single indicator of adherence across multiple condition classes uh, or medication classes. And it's going to help to roll up the information in a way that we think will make the measure more usable, especially in programs over time. Uh, so really in general, as, as measures mature, in their life cycle and performance in a program improves. Integrating or building measures into a composite um, is a pretty natural step in order to maintain focus on adherence uh, while also reducing sort of the total number of measures in a program, maybe freeing up some space for other new measures. So this is a measure that we have a technical expert panel convened for. Um, actually, that's first meeting is next week. So we're really excited to get this work underway. I think we really envision this being a, a meaningful measure and an important part of the next step for adherence here at PQA. And uh, Melissa, I believe I'll pass it to you for some of the other things that are uh, in store for the future of adherence. Thanks, Ben. So like many other organizations today, PQA has committed to champion equity and address health disparities in medication use quality. This commitment is solidified through our blueprint 2025 as a key objective and has been endorsed by our members, CMS, and other stakeholder groups. This commitment to equity is important because data suggests that disparities in adherence rates exist despite the high performance rates on the adherence measures. For example, there are significant differences in adherence race, uh, inherent adherence rates by race, age, income, dual eligibility status, and geographic location. Stratification is one approach to advance equity by targeting and highlighting the areas where further improvement in the quality of medication use is needed. Let's pause on this concept of stratification for a moment. Stratification and risk adjustment are often discussed in healthcare quality measurement as a one or the other approach, but both are useful to understanding quality. With stratification, you are looking at raw measure rates versus adjusted rates, like in risk adjustment. You can stratify by any number of characteristics, depending on how robust your data are. Stratification is a fairly straightforward method to better identify and understand priority areas for interventions and quality improvement efforts. With risk adjustment, advanced statistical methods are applied to create more of a level playing field among measured entities. This approach is meant to avoid penalizing measured entities for serving those that may have characteristics outside the provider's control, which are associated with worse measure performance. 
Without risk adjustment and quality measurement, payers and providers might be incentivized to cherry pick their patients, but by removing that concern, the measure rates represent quality of care rather than other confounding factors. Both methods are useful for quality measures and PQA has provided recommendations for using risk adjustment on our adherence measures. And we are also supportive of stratifying measure rates. And with that, I'll turn that back over to Lisa. Thank you. We do have some questions pouring in. So um, please do enter any additional questions that you have using the question and answer feature at the bottom of the screen. And um, I will start it off <coughs> with a um, question I think for Ben. Uh, why don't we see alignment among related measures? And the examples provided are exclusion criteria differing between, and um, hopefully you know these abbreviations, uh, SPC, um, and then statin use in persons with diabetes is the PQA measure and then uh, the statin adherence measure. Yeah, thanks Lisa. So, so there's kind of a couple layers to this one that we can peel back. Uh, first of all, I, I appreciate the question. It's a really good question. Um, so SPC, first of all, that's going to be statin use in persons with cardiovascular disease. That's actually an NCQA measure. So that does not fall directly into PQA's purview as it's not our measure. We do work closely with NCQA to try to harmonize to the extent possible, but um, I'm going to consider that out of scope sort of for my, my specific answer. I'll focus a little bit more on the PQA measures. So, so first of all, one thing that I wanna draw up is it's important to realize that even though these measures both include a component related to statin use, right? Statin use in persons with diabetes, adherence to statins, they are different measures and they are mechanically different measures. Statin use in persons with diabetes is sort of a, a gap closure or a appropriate use measure while well, adherence is an adherence measure. So, so really when you think about what those mean, the adherence to statins has this requirement like all adherence measures that you have two different prescription claims for statins uh, on different dates of services to be included in the measure. And when it comes to exclusions, when you have to have two different fills on different dates of service, uh, that makes some of these SUPD exclusions really not necessary. Uh, so if, imagine we have individuals with cirrhosis who are excluded from SUPD. Those individuals with cirrhosis are contraindicated from receiving statins. So we really wouldn't expect to see them getting two different statins anyway and falling into the measure uh, and then having their adherence monitored. You can also think about some of the other exclusions, right? So you have uh, you have to have rhabdomyolysis, you have myopathy. Um, those individuals, right, in many cases are not necessarily going to be refilling the statin after they've experienced this. There are some instances where they are, right? This patient could be rechallenged over time. Um, but what we wouldn't expect is for those patients to fall into the measure year over year if they truly have these conditions, right? Um, they wouldn't continue to fall into the eligible population because they wouldn't be perpetually necessarily rechallenged. But on the other hand, with SUPD, the way you get into the uh, eligible population is actually based off of your diabetes medications. So if you're contraindicated from a statin, you're going to continue to fall into this eligible population year over year over year, and you're never going to see that statin. So that's where, as a longitudinal problem, you have these exclusions that come in uh, and try to carve out some of these, these situations where there are alternative indications or contraindications. Um, you know, we, we do certainly try to, I don't want to, make it out like we don't uh, closely align these measures to the extent possible. You know, the medication lists, those sorts of things are well harmonized. And I think that their construction is consistent. Uh, but I guess I would just advise against sort of a quick glance and seeing statin in two places um, and assuming that all of the decisions would be the same because the differences are both from a measurement science and a clinical perspective. So a wordy answer for you, but I hope it was helpful. Thanks, Ben. Um, and actually, that's a commonly asked question. I, I feel like we, we should post some FAQs on that. So um, thanks. So um, Ben, I'm going to throw something else to you that um, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with. Um, I, I'm going to combine two questions. So the first is, are there other common chronic diseases beyond those covered, the, the big three, um, where adherence where an adherence measure might be useful. And then another participant is asking if there's plans to seek 
the um, PDC um, DOAC, direct oral, um, direct acting oral anticoagulants measure into part C and D quality programs. These questions, Lisa, are coming in faster than, uh, than I can keep up with. So I'm going, to, I'm going to answer the DOAC one first, and then I might, uh, might kindly ask you to repeat the first one. Sure. I, I can only remember one thing at a time. Okay, sure, sorry. Um, so great question. Um, PDC DOAC has actually been on our mind a lot, especially as we've thought about uh, this new health plan composite that we talked about, and we evaluated the portfolio of measures and, and what might be good fits. PDC DOAC is a really strong measure, especially... If you look at the literature and the data, you can see that the, the increase in the use of warfarin, or rather the decrease in the use of warfarin has, has you know, sort of naturally coincided with this very, very steep increase in the use of DOACs, meaning that this measure is becoming more relevant, it's touching more patients, it's a very important disease state. Um, so the question is, would PQA seek to implement this measure into uh, the Part D quality programs? You know, I, I think that it's a challenging question to answer directly. We have a very strong collaborative relationship with CMS, but we do not, you know, have any direct control, right, over what does or doesn't go into the stars. So there's certainly situations where we may say, hey, this, this DOAC measure is a very good measure. You might consider this. In fact, uh, those who have a good memory might remember that CMS actually looked at it a few years ago and did some analysis that was published, I think, in the 2000. 19 or 18 advance notice. And uh, since then, the data has continued to show an, an increase in the number of members you know, being touched by this measure. Um, so it's certainly possible that they, they return to it. And I think that um, speaking for myself, I'd, I'd be happy to, to see it used in a CMS quality program. Thanks, Ben. And then I'll follow on with the first question I asked is, uh, what else are we looking at? What other chronic conditions might we consider adherence measures for in addition to those that are already in the PQ8 measure manual? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, we're always looking for measures that fit the sort of sweet spot for adherence measures, right? There's some of those things I talked about that are principles of good adherence measures things that uh, you're not expecting discontinuation, things with a relatively low number of alternative indications where some indications may be PRN, or maybe we know there's a really high degree of, of uh, off-label use in some way that's going to introduce a lot of noise into the measure. And then we also want to think, once that's all done, how many people is this going to touch? Uh, what are sort of the, the impact per person, right? It's always going to be quantity of people times you know, the proportion of impact, whether that's on their quality of life or associated costs. Um, so to be specific, one area that has sort of emerged as a, an area of interest from our most recent conceptualization efforts is a PDC for heart failure. So many of you in the know are going to know that uh, medication use is a really important part of, of heart failure management. There are sort of complex regimens uh, that there's a lot of emphasis on getting patients started on, first of all, the appropriate regimen, and then also to be adherent to those medications over time. Um, so PQA is looking at that. It's a little bit more complex whenever you're doing adherence for something that has multiple parts, right, that has a regimen of multiple drugs, and especially when those multiple drugs uh, may vary depending on individual clinical characteristics, whether or not a patient is on one option or another option, and how exactly you can have a measure logic that captures all that. So all that's to say, that's an area of interest. I think it's somewhere where we would look to do some pre-development research so that we could hit the ground running in development. We might look a little more at those classes and the data, uh, look at the effectiveness of those classes um, as proxies for heart failure um, and things like that. But that's, uh, that's something concrete that, that I, I'm comfortable putting out. Ben? So I'm gonna uh, share the fun. Uh, Melissa, um, the... We have a compliment about the work done to evaluate the extent to which the measures are topped out in the Part D star ratings. Will the results be, will that analysis be published or presented in greater detail? Oh, well, thank you very much for that compliment. Um, yeah, actually, um, the three of us just um, drafted a manuscript and it's been accepted for publication in population health uh, management. And as soon as that is available, we can um, share that more widely. And a lot of the points we made today will be available in that manuscript. Thank you. Yeah, more to come on that. And then um, also Melissa, um, I don't know the extent to which you'll really be able to answer this question. It's um, 
but I'll, I'll throw it out to you anyways. So although the adherence measures may not be topped out yet, does it make sense for them to account for um, the weighting that they do a third to a half of the total star ratings? Well, I mean, that's a legitimate question. Um, you know, we aren't CMS, so we can't speak for them, but um, knowing the principles that they have, these measures in the Part D star ratings represent the few clinical measures that there are. There are other measures about patient experience and plan experience, but um, there are very few clinical measures. And on top of that, it's an intermediate outcome measure, which is important to CMS. So I would say for those reasons, it's likely they have the uh, weighting that they do. Um, but again, not speaking on behalf of CMS here. Thank you. Um, ben, we have a, a couple of questions about the um, composite adherence measure. The, there's the pharmacy one that was just endorsed by our membership and then a potential future um, health plan measure to be developed. Um, how is this determined? Is it the average of each individual? Um, et cetera, and so forth, or is the PDC determined upon required overlap of all drugs? So basic yes. construct would be good. <laughs> so this is the part, uh, Lisa, where usually I flip to my visualizing a composite slide. So I'm, I'm hamstrung here with the resources at hand, but essentially um, looking at this question, so what it is not uh, is going to be, it's not going to be an average uh, of each individual, right, that pharmacy level composite. Um, and individuals actually aren't required to fall into three classes. So individuals can fall into one, two, or three classes. And essentially what's most helpful to, to sort of conceptualize it um, from a framework perspective is that individuals are falling into these component measures, right? A component ROSA measure, a component statin measure, a component diabetes measure. Those measures are be being calculated then independently of one another. And then they enter sort of what I consider the second level of the composite. So that's going to be where those measure rates are then aggregated, they're weighted, uh, and then they form the actual composite rate. So they're weighted in a way that we actually call natural weighting or opportunity-based weighting. Um, and that's going to be essentially each composite is weighted uh, in proportion to the number of patients with it. So if a given pharmacy, talking about the pharmacy composite here, was treating 50 statin patients and 10 diabetes patients and 10 ROSA patients. Uh, those statin patients, that score would be weighted for the fact that they have five times as many patients. Um, so that's sort of a, a little bit of an overview. I know it's a little challenging without visual aids, uh, but hopefully that's helpful. Now for the health plan composite, um, I think we envision a similar structure, but I will caveat by saying that, you know, we have the technical expert panel kickoff next week. So I'm um, I'm going to be way ahead of the curve if I uh, make any sort of definitive statements about how that measure will be structured. Um, so I will, I will stop talking there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I'll kind of throw this out to either of you. Um, there's, sorry, two related questions and I'll try and make it one. Um, so there's a question about whether or not we'll be able to exclude individuals who are using manufacturer programs in the adherence measures. Um, which you know currently we're we're not able to do, um, but there's a, a related question: uh, Can can we commission PQA um, a PQA study to understand the impact of of these other types of um, claims like cash, dis discount cards, etc., on adherence measures? I mean, that's a great question. I mentioned the blueprint earlier in the talk today, and something else in our blueprint is wanting to understand the impact of measures further. Um, being the senior director of research here at PQA, I'm happy to have more discussions on what exactly you wanna look at and how we can further the evidence base that, um, you know, that underscores these uh, measures. So yeah, we should definitely connect on that. Thanks. Um, anything to add, Ben? No, I, th I think that, uh... I think that Melissa summed it up. Okay. Um, so Ben, you might be able to answer this. I can help you out if, if not. Um, is there a, an ability to adjust for recalled medications? So when there's um, 
and I, I would say I would extend the question to um, shortages. So um, like quinapril, um, for example, is a recalled medication. Yeah, so I might rely on you a little bit, Lisa. Mm -hmm. I know that these there are sort of in true shortages of recalls, right? These, these become a little bit of a extraordinary situation, right? A situation that's outside the norm. Um, and Lisa, I, I think that you probably know more about this than me, but I know that often in quality programs specifically, when these sorts of events are going on, uh, the administrators of those programs typically have the flexibility to make some sort of adjustment temporary in nature to address the fact that clearly you can't go on fairly measuring uh, a medication adherence to something that pharmacists can't get their hands on. Um, I'll pass it to you, though. Yeah, sure. We do get asked this question a lot, uh, you know, um, even before the pandemic and then through the pandemic. Um, we don't typically adjust our measures because there's a, a delay in terms of implementation of those specifications. So if there were some type of an adjustment, it might be made at, at the implementation or programmatic level. Um, but we also have not seen any specific data or evidence suggesting that this adversely impacts some or disproportionately impacts some plans more than others, so, and, which is really one of the things that we um, consider when looking at modifying measures to improve validity. Uh, it's a great, great question and a common question. And... Let's see, we, my gosh, there's tons of questions. This is awesome. Um, so uh, how do you guys balance the, the need for digital measures with the real challenge in plan level and pharmacy measures um, in HL7 standards based measures instead of claims? Um, it's kind of a complex question. What are, what are we doing uh, in the digital space? Um, and, you know, what are some of the considerations? Yeah, so this, this is a, a really good question. Um, and, and hey, Mike, long time no talk. But, um, you know, you're, you're right, essentially. You know, my first reaction when I read this was, this is really challenging. For those who, um, who aren't aware, CMS has sort of put out this uh, moonshot, I think many measure developers would call it, uh, goal of having an all digital sort of measurement ecosystem in their major programs by 2025. Digital measures being a specific type of measure that's specified according to different standards. Uh, it's, it's something that can be sort of ingested by, by machines, it's machine consumable and can be calculated automatically. Basically an ECQM uh, for non-hospital uh, or provider settings. Um, but there are a lot of challenges associated with getting there. I think that there, there is certainly a gap in the current um, knowledge and expertise base between all of these entities that are being measured around the languages involved with digital measures and the ability to organize their data in a way that is going to allow uh, an engine that's going to calculate a DQM to do what it needs to do. Um, there's certainly a, a lack of knowledge from many different measurement organizations around having the skills in-house to develop and code in these languages. Um, and, and I think that when you consider how long it took us to get some modicum of success with ECQMs uh, and EHRs and, and meaningful use, um, and then you consider this as sort of an extension of that and even further into some other settings, I think it becomes clear that we can expect a lot of bumps along the road. Uh, I mean, PQA specifically, you know, we have staff in house that are, are studied up on these techniques. We've, we've worked with different organizations internally and externally. We work with the pharmacy uh, health information technology collaborative, the PHIT collaborative, um, and a number of different uh, e-care plan vendors, for example. So we are sort of preparing for this sort of shift but I think that it's, it's an area that's gonna be really challenging for everyone involved. I think it's gonna be challenging for the, the government and the, the programs. I think it's gonna be challenging for the developers and it's probably not gonna be all that easy for the measured entities either. Um, so that really is my, my two cents. And I don't know if Lisa or Melissa have anything to add. No, thanks, Ben. Um, we do have a, additional questions that we won't be able to answer, I apologize, but uh, I'll throw one more to 
Um, Melissa, um, so providers often don't agree with the clinical utility of STAR medication adherence measures because the measurement period is limited to the calendar year versus a rolling time frame. And so this is kind of a practical question that they're asking, what suggestions do you have to ensure providers understand why um, measures were created the way they were um, by calendar year only? Yeah, I can understand the nature of that question. And um, this is really a programmatic design, a programmatic being the STARS program itself, which again, PQA doesn't you know, have any influence on. Um, but um, from my knowledge base, there are few measures that use rolling years. And those that do primarily do it uh, to um, increase their sample size. So on a year-to-year -year basis, there are sample size issues. They have to use a rolling basis. Those types of measures, um, often the rates are watered down because they use a rolling basis. So there are some upsides to the calendar year, but primarily it's done because the program operates on a calendar year basis. Thanks, Melissa. So we do have a lot of questions. I'll say a lot of them are about <laughs> um, a, a different measure, statin use in persons with diabetes measure and the exclusions and questions around that. And, and we'll be addressing that um, hopefully through stakeholder advisory meetings in the future and see to what extent we can follow up on any of these remaining questions, but really appreciate your engagement very much. And um, for those of you who are tracking the relevant literature in, in, <laughs> in this very small font, we have a, a list of the citations and um, these slides will be available um, via download. So we do encourage you to access the, um, the supporting literature. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Amanda. <laughs> 